Hello sir, thank you so much for joining us from Karnataka today. Of course, physical interaction happens to be an impossibility at the current moment. But how do you think her life has been like with your friends in your retirement community? It couldn't be better than this. This is the best time of my life. I am 73 years old now. I've okay. slogged all my life. I've been all over the country. I worked hard for my family. I devoted myself to my profession. I've had a number of health problems at the end of my profession. And when I retired, all my tensions vanished. And I'm now, uh, it's now four years since uh, I moved into the retirement home where I'm now living. And it's 10 years since I retired. So we, uh, I have met a lot of people in the same age group as me here. And we are about 50 residents already. And we are all just like one large family. We have yes. got to, we got close to each other. We now move lot uh, we now know a lot about each other's families it's a completely cosmopolitan retirement home and we have couples from all parts of the country speaking all kinds of languages so it's really wonderful being over here and i couldn't be happier than i am and more satisfied than i am so many people love the idea of retirement some people work for the idea of retirement some people despise it where do you think you stand on the spectrum and how do you think and do you think retirement can change a person's personality? Oh yes, certainly. I love retired life. I've been looking forward to it and I have absolutely no regrets for having retired at the age of 62. It's now 11 years since I retired. It's I'm yes. 73 now. And uh, you see, in life, we all have to do what we have got to do, what we are yes. forced to do, what we have to do in order to make a living. That stage is now gone. And yes. all that time, there is always a time when you feel that I wish I had the time, I wish I had the means and the resources to do, not what I have to do, but what I want to do. Yes. So that opportunity finally has come. Now, no one obliges me to do anything. I don't have to satisfy anybody. I have no obligations. I don't have deadlines to meet. I don't have expectations to satisfy. Yes. So I am now my own boss. And that feeling is so, um, I mean, it gives me such a feeling of elation and satisfaction that I'm, I'm completely enjoying my retired life. I would not go back to my profession. Of course, I've had several opportunities. People mm -hmm. told me, no, you're still strong enough. You can still have juice left in you. You can still go on and we'll give you a lot of opportunities. They want me to be a consultant. I have spurned all those offers and yes. I'm perfectly content leading my present retired life. Even my wife is happy because she too has seen the tensions I've gone through, particularly towards the end of my career. And she's also extremely happy that I retired. My children too are extremely happy that I've retired. They said, if it's a question of uh, money, don't worry. We are there to back you up. Of course, so far I've not needed their money. I'm completely financially independent. But I know that I have the backing of my adult children who are settled abroad, who can support me in case uh, it's required. But and there is no compulsion be, for me to go back. And that must be a Pardon? securing feeling, I'm so sure. Yes, it's a feeling of security. So far, I have not needed it. But I know that there is somebody behind me in case I need it. So there's no reason for me to accept any of the offers of consultancy or part-time work, no. And now, of course, I've ruled everything out by moving to a far-off place called Devanahalli. I'm away from Bangalore. Yes. I left Bangalore four years ago and I'm living in a retirement home in a small town called Devanahalli near the airport. And yes. this is about 45 to 50 kilometers. So the question of commuting to Bangalore doesn't arise. I'm perfectly happy. This is my present state of mind. Do you think retirement has given you or helped you to find your interest as a person? And uh, I mean, given you time to explore your interests. Aside from Quora, what other niches do you escape to, to re seek refuge at this stage of life? Yes, absolutely. Retired life has given me the opportunity to go back to my hobbies. Yes. There were, I have one of my, one of my main hobbies, which I loved was writing. Uh, yes. During the pre-internet years, when we didn't have all these facilities, the only writing I used to do was writing long letters, long letters to my parents when I was away from my uh, parents. I was I spent seven years away from them living in BRTS Pilari 
when I did my uh, graduate degree. Then I was yes. for two years in a place called Roorkee where I got my master's degree. All those seven years, I was away from my parents. And every week, I would write at least one long letter going into more than a thousand to two thousand words. Now, I'm describing everything. And I loved doing it. And my parents too loved receiving such letters. Then as long as my grandfather was alive, I used to keep him very happy by writing to him at least one letter a month, telling him all about myself and he would reply. So yes. he was he was really happy to see because in our family, in our family, he was the first person to have learned the English language wow. during the British days. My grandfather, my, my great grandfather never spoke a word. Yeah, in the pre-independence day, my great grandfather never spoke a word of English. Okay. So my grandfather was the first person to actually study English and I can quite imagine what kind of uh, achievement it was because he lived in a village where he had to go long distance to go to school. There was no electricity. He has learned by the light of the oil lamps. There was no one to teach him. He had to teach himself. And then, of course, those were British days where knowledge of English was very useful. So he set about learning with a passion and he soon became the headmaster of the school and he was teaching English by the time he retired. So he would, he was my first English teacher and then he would, uh, you know, uh, correct my letters to him, correct the grammatical mistakes, encourage me to have a better handwriting. So I remember those days. That was my main hobby, but I could never indulge in it to my heart's content when I was a busy professional because yes, life because. in an office as a structural designer, I was doing industrial building design all the time. I was dealing with drawings, calculations, diagrams, and yes. uh, uh, of course, my domestic commitments, my bringing up children and uh, running the household, all these things never gave me any time. So that. I, that, that, yeah, that hobby retracted to the background. Hmm. Then I loved music. I always wanted to learn a pure musical instrument. There was a time in college, I picked up the flute and I started practicing and afterwards gave it up because firstly, somebody told me you don't have enough talent. I said, I agreed. Secondly, I that uh, learning to play a musical instrument needs a kind of devotion, devotion and a certain kind of hard practice, which I found that I was not able to do. So I had given it up. Okay. And there were so many other things like reading. I used to be a voracious reader during my uh, pre-professional years. But once I got into the profession, I didn't get time. So now after my retired life, I've got gone back to my hobbies. I write a lot now, much more than I ever used to write. And the, it's an uh, exhilarating feeling to be able to write something and uh, you know access and reach so thousands people. of people all over the world in within a matter of minutes. And the feedback I get in the form of comments, supports, likes or whatever is so satisfying that this is one of the best feelings that you can get. So I'm very happy about uh, getting back to these hobbies. I also start wanted to learn to play bridge I never had the time. Now in my retired life, Every day, we, we and my friends get together and for a bridge session. Then we do so many other things for which I have time. I go for long walks, keeping my headphones in my head and uh, listening to YouTube, podcasts, discourses or whatever. So all these hobbies for which I never had time, I'm now able to do during retired life. So this is uh, the answer to your question. Okay. Over the years, sir, you have emerged as a very well-monumented writer. Do you think that the response you have received from your audience has changed you? It has made me a better person. It has made me more humble. It has made me more grateful. Yes. And I'm also thankful because for the first time, I have got appreciation for something. I have never, never got this much appreciation for anything that I have done in my lifetime. Yes. So the satisfaction I get by being able to approach and access so many people is extremely satisfying. So that's, uh, it has changed me. And also at the same time, it's not always 100% positive feedback. Yes. You know, you can't keep everybody happy all the time. Uh, my political views and my views on certain social issues put off certain people. And some of them react with criticism, which I definitely accept. Some of them after one uh, point so using the you being on the level of writing and uh, being on the level that you are in the platform. I think you must have to come into terms with uh, criticism. Yeah, not criticism. Not only criticism, abuse, trolling, abuse, yes. all kinds. Yeah, I have uh, tasted all of them. Of course, that's very little. Yes. Mostly it is appreciation. Mostly it's appreciation. That's uh, that's heartening. At the same time, uh, I get criticism too, but. When the criticism is well intended and well taken, I welcome it. 
I sometimes I have even sometimes changed my answers, edited my answers when I receive yes. criticism. At the same time, I also take in my stride occasional abuses and troll attacks from some people. Yes. So that's also part of life, and it's part of life on the internet. Nothing can be done about it. Yes. I just live with it. Do you think that Quora has made you a more curious person, or were you committed to lifelong learning from the very start? Aside from curiosity, what other effects did Quora have on you? I was always curious. So Quora okay. didn't make me curious. Quora made me more curious. Hmm. Now that I have an, a platform and a, a means by which I can get more information by simply asking, I welcomed it. So okay. Quora made me a little more curious. Quora also exposed me to the world yes. so far i have always interacted with my family my close friends my relatives my office colleagues mm. i never got an opportunity to interact with people around the world from different Must cultures have... from different countries so that was definitely a big big uh, positive gain from kora it must have also broadened your perspective i'm sure Definitely, I now learned to appreciate certain viewpoints which I could not have done earlier. Mm -hmm. I now realize that the Western world is different, their culture is different, their uh, standard of living is different, and their history is different. Yes. So I can quite now understand and appreciate some of their viewpoints. So definitely, that's a, that is uh, one positive influence of Kora. Yes, you are writing. It has also made me more humble and grateful. Yes. Okay, because uh, I never expected that, that uh, I would hit it off with so many people around the mm. world. This was something new to me, which I was not even aware that I was capable of. Yes. You know, um, your writing reflects a very observant person. Combined with the time you have spent on the platform, what are your thoughts on Quora's evolution? Okay. Quora has evolved, definitely. I yes. may take a little longer to Absolutely. dwell on this point. I joined Quora in 2015. Yes. And Quora has been around from 2010. The company was formed in 2009. Yes. And they went, uh, it actually appeared and then it invited for people to join in 2010. Yes. At that time, it was a very small group of very informed people, invited writers, Oh, who are all experts in their fields, mostly academicians and uh, professionals. And they all enjoyed this platform where they could ask an answer and there was very little traffic, not much traffic. But yes. as traffic grew, what happened was things went out of control. Too, too many people Absolutely. joined. After some time, the, yeah, the quality of questions fell. At the same time, then Quora also steadily improved. What they did was they introduced new facilities, the facility to mute, block, select your topics, monetizing. do so many other things. Monet monetizing came later. I'll come to that later. Yeah. I'm talking about the early years. Hmm. And Quora was a completely non-professional platform. There were no ads. There was no QPP. There was no Quora Plus. There was no monetiz monetization. So it was purely an academic platform which everybody enjoyed. How was this possible? It was because the founders of Quora, who are all former executives of Facebook, they left Facebook, put in their own money, quite a few million dollars each, and set up this platform and invested their money and grew this platform bit by bit yes. to make it one of the most popular platforms in the world, which was respected by everyone and which had enjoyed a high rating in the world. Mm -hmm. And even Google would direct so many searches to Quora. So mm -hmm. that was the time when Quora was at its peak. It had respectability and it had uh, influence too. So, but this couldn't last long. How long can the investors go on pumping money to run this platform and there's no ad and when there's no revenue? So ultimately, they had to do what was inevitable, which they had been postponing. So they introduced ads sometime in 2016, I think. Okay. Not very sure about it. Either late 2015 or sometime in 2016. That, of course, did have its effect on quality. So what happened was it became commercial. So some of the people were disappointed, but nobody had an answer to uh, the question of how Quora can continue to survive and meet their expenses when you don't have ads. So they have to monetize. So the <coughs> earliest monetizing it, was through ads. It went from a you know question and answer website to a social networking website. It, social networking was added to it. Started, yes. People started socializing on it. 
So these mm -hmm. changes work, came with Quora. And the next big change with Quora was the major significant change was that they departed from only English and they introduced languages like Spanish, French, German, Italian, the Euro European languages initially. And then they could spread their influence. Regional Afterwards, the, 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 the next big, big jump was adding Indian languages. They started with Hindi, then they moved to Bengali, Marathi, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Gujarati. So you name it. So now they have the whole world. Practically all the major languages of the world are covered. So this was one tremendous advance, a yes. great progress that they made. And by this means, they, they spread their footprint all over the world. So this is one major big development. Yes. The next development was something which is unfortunate or fortunate, depending on how you look at it. That is what they called as QPP. I can understand their compulsions. QPP is a Quora partner program, program. where they started paying. Yeah, where they started paying people for asking questions. It has been criticized left and right by everybody. It has been condemned and cursed. By, and, they, and they say that it has Absolutely. brought down the quality of Quora. All that is true. But Quora had its own compulsions. You see, they depended on ad revenue. You needed more and more pages for putting your ads. And how do you get it? You get by answers. How do the answers come? They come from the questions. So the question is the seed that sprouts all the answers on all the answer pages and provide yes. space for all the ads. So they needed to incentivize the asking of questions and they were not satisfied with the number of questions that were being asked. Yes. So most of the questions were unanswered. So the best way is to ask more and more questions so that at least the percentage of questions that are asked, say 10% or 20%, at least that provides enough space for ads. So they brought in this scheme with good intentions of rewarding the question writer. A lot of people were upset. They said, no, the answer writer should be rewarded. But Kura could not do that because how many answer writers will you reward? And the money that was so small, how can you distribute it among so many answer writers? And people get people hundreds get of thousands of uh, exactly. views on each exactly. answer. Exactly. And then who is going to be paid? Is it be paid on views? Is it paid on upwards? Is it paid on quality? Who is going exactly. to sit and decide quality? All that is not practical. So they had simply decided to reward the question right. This was both a boon and a curse. Curse because quality went down, people abused it, and they started on posting all kinds of junk questions, and a lot of good people left. At the same time, it was a boon because they, their advertising revenue jumped up. And initially in 2018 and 19, they were able to pay very handsomely to the people who asked questions. The next step was this monetization. Quora Plus. This is also another development, and this is also being badly criticized. Mm -hmm. I support it because Quora brought in monetization only to address the complaints of the people who said that you are rewarding the wrong people. You are rewarding a person who asks a question, and all the people who put in their talent, time, and energy to yes. answer it, you're giving them nothing. Absolutely. And they also say that you're rewarding, you're rewarding the space owner. Who is a space owner? A space owner is merely collecting the answers of others and keeping them in one place. He's curating, and you're giving that man who merely collects the answers and uh, posts it in his space, and you are rewarding him. And you're not rewarding the original writer. The people actually so put in effort. Exactly. So Cora decided to make a correction. I said, all right, let us start rewarding the writers, but they didn't have the money to do so. So what did they do? They introduced a subscription program and they made it purely voluntary. He says, if you want, go ahead. Subscribe $5 a month or $50 a year. If you pay this, then we collect all this money and form a corpus. From this corpus, we pay the answer writers depending on the engagement that they get. It is a perfectly yeah. fair arrangement and no one was forced to monetize. No one was forced to spare. Whoever subscribe. wants to will do it. So, yeah, exactly. Whoever wants to can take advantage. Whoever doesn't want to can do that. Yeah. But I, unfortunately, this uh, monetization is being criticized very badly and uh, Quora is somehow dealing with it, but I don't know how far this will go. So many people, particularly in India, people are not subscribing. Majority of the Quorans are not subscribing. The few yes. subscriptions are coming from abroad. And that's why monetization hasn't worked for people who have uh, actually started monetizing. And the houses. vast representation am, I, of audience is Indian. So. Yes, yes. 30%, more than 30% is Indian. And I think between India and the USA, we are running neck and neck in the number of members. Yes. So in India, $5 is a lot of money. And particularly, a lot of these Korans are school students who have to part with their precious pocket money to subscribe. And they wouldn't be willing to do it. Another thing is the expectation in India that all social media content should be free. Facebook is free. 
YouTube is free, Google is free, Wikipedia is free. Why should Quora charge? And there are people yeah. who say Quora is not worth paying for. Why should I pay for all this junk? Who wants? So this kind of attitudes prevail, and that's why your know, monetization for Indian writers has not been successful. I have monetized my answers, and I have practically made nothing out of it. Okay. But at the same time, I'm continuing because I want to cooperate with Quora, and I'm hoping that in future they may succeed, and that more and more people will come on board. So these are the developments that Quora has seen over the last uh, five to ten years. In Anything my... else you would like to ask? Mm. In my Angela quote goes, "Wouldn't take nothing from my journey." Do you think that applies to you? I would agree with it. See, I interpret that uh, statement as, "Would you would you want anything in your life to change?" No. Exactly. Will you accept an inducement or something if you could change anything in the past? No. Listen, every life is full of ups and downs. I am happy that my life has been more ups than downs. I've had a good life. I had good parents. They educated me. I had a good career. I had a good company. I worked hard. I had job satisfaction. I earned what I needed. I got a good wife. I am very happy. I had two very good children, talented children. They are doing extremely well for themselves. And I've had reasonably good health. I have not suffered any major setback except minor ones. And today I am happily settled in a retirement home with oh, one minute meeting has been upgraded by the host and now includes unlimited minutes. Okay, okay. And then what? Uh, I have um, now settled in a retirement home. I have enough money to be able to support myself. What more can I want? I wouldn't like my life to change. I don't want to take a risk. If you say yes. that, suppose now you have my life all over again. Shall I take a different path? No. I would continue with the same path because I'm happy with what I've got. And I'm basically a simple person who's contented with small things in life. So I would uh, agree with her. If this is yes. my, my interpretation of her, please. Thank you. I love that answer. Thank you so much. Where do you see yourself five years from now? What, five years from now, very simple arithmetic shows. I'm now 73. In five years, I'll be 78. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I will be... <laughs> right now, I am a junior old man. <laughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> you start stepping into old age in the 60s. Mm. So at 73, I'm somewhere, I would say, between junior and middle. In 78, I'll be stepping close to being a senior old man. Yes. And I don't know how long I'm going to live, but that's up to God and <laughs> nobody knows. But in 78, I expect nothing to change except that my health will be probably a little... Uh, not as good as it is now because the same thing 10 years ago I was healthier 20 years ago I was even healthier so the body's uh, parts slowly give way and I can so, feel the decay I can feel loss of abilities so in 78 five years from now it is possible that I will be having a little less health than I right now have then so on Quora yeah, so, go ahead. Now. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it's uh, really interesting you said that because uh, it's really surprising that you have come into terms that your health will continue to degrade, which seems to be a sort of, I mean, people can't come into terms with that, many people. Yes, and then other minor things. Uh, well, I expect my grandson, my grandson is now nine years old. Mm -hmm. He is like a child, so I have to play with him. Now, I'm looking forward to the time when I'll be able to have an intelligent conversation with him and also yes. teach him. We interact regularly over FaceTime, Zoom, or WhatsApp. Every, at least once or twice a week, we interact. Each time, he now talks to me about his toys and about his school and all that. And then I also, you know, talk to him very fondly. But yes. then in five years from now, he'll be a teenager. And that is a time when uh, I, I will be able to have very constructive conversations with him and be able to mold his character. I'm looking forward to that. That's in five years. In five years, uh, I am now living in a retirement home and this is a new building. A mm. lot of facilities are yet to come up. Our township is yet to develop. In five years from now, I'm expecting a lot of improvements. We are close to the international airport. The terminal two is coming up and that whole area is being developed. So quality of life ought to improve in five years that I'm looking forward to. Yes. Then lastly, yes, I have a son who is 35 now and he's still unmarried because he's totally devoted to his career. So when I ask him about marriage, he says, take it easy. I'll take, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Don't worry. Don't pressurize me. I said, okay. But I'm hoping that uh, in five years, I hope I have a daughter-in-law in addition to a daughter. I now have a daughter. 
I hope I have a daughter-in-law in addition to a daughter. So these are what I'm looking forward to in five years from now. When was the first time you realized that the effect you had on your audience, the effect your writing had on your audience? Oh. It was, uh, I think I wrote it down. Two incidents I can recall. I don't know which is more important. One was, uh, we have these um, Pura meetups at mm. Bangalore. In various places, uh, members the of Pura week. occasionally, yeah, they have a meetup. And Bangalore uh, Korans are pretty active in this. Before COVID, before the pandemic, yes. uh, there was a group which used to organize a meetup every month on the second or third Saturday of every month, we all okay. used to meet at a public park called Kaban Park in Bangalore. Mm. And uh, a minimum of 25 and sometimes 50 to 60 people would gather and we would all just meet informally and uh, under the shade of trees, sit on the ground on rocks on grass and spread out and somebody brings tea, somebody brings snacks, somebody like a brings picnic. some books. You are, yes, like a picnic. And then we all sit down together and then have a nice chit chat. Sometimes we yes. split into small groups and then we discuss uh, the topics of uh, interest. So this was regularly going on and I could feel the difference in me because a lot of people used to eagerly wait for my uh, coming there. Yeah. Then uh, once a year, Kora used to conduct the so-called World Kora Meetup. At different yes, places. yes. And, uh, yeah, that's the place where, and, and that was a once in a year occasion. And uh, those occasions were when instead of 25 or 50, about 250 to 300 people would gather. So the whole, the park was to be filled, a huge crowd. And I was, I attended at least three of those meets. I have attended wow. one in San Francisco also. I have attended one in San Francisco also at the Cora's head office in 2019. Hmm. But the biggest, what do you call, uh, uh, this incident I'm talking about was in the second such meetup uh, when more than 250 people gathered I didn't have to introduce myself to anybody. People wow. could came rushing up to me, treated me like a celebrity. <laughs> I was mobbed. I was mobbed by them. And people gathered around me. And then some they did something which I never thought I would do in my life. And they asked me for my autograph. And they wanted to pose with me for selfies. So the first time I felt how a celebrity feels <laughs> when he is mobbed like this. Yes. It had a deep and lasting effect on me. I never thought that I was so popular. And a lot of people, I mean, I even posted a picture of that in one of my Quora posts. And okay. that post has been wildly popular with a lot of them. The second most touching thing about Quora was when a girl yes. from out of the blue, an American girl, okay, American girl, wrote to me saying that I wish, she made a proposal to me. Yes. Not for marrying me, but no. she wanted to be my daughter-in-law. You talked about this she in says, the last interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was absolutely touching. She wrote me a long letter saying that I know you have a gifted son. I know he's a Rhodes Scholar. I know that he's in Oxford and he's teaching there. I want to marry him. And I don't care how he is as a person. I want you as my father-in-law and your wife as my mother-in-law. How flattering. I promise. I pro ah, yeah, yeah, very flattering it was. I promise to adjust to how your son wants me to be and I... I'm even willing to convert to Hinduism. I'm even willing to learn your language and I'm willing to adopt your customs, all kinds of things she wrote. It was partly hilarious and partly touching, partly, yes. I don't know how to call it, but then it had a lasting effect on me. Yes. I wrote a very long reply to her, uh, thanked her and then politely extricated myself and said, I'm sorry, but uh, I don't decide. I, she had thought that uh, in India, arranged marriages, parents decide everything. I said, no, I, I'm a modern person. I have no such plans. My son will marry whomever he wants at yes. the time of his choosing. And I will not, I cannot even propose this to him. He will yes. obviously be offended with me. So I wish you all the best and thank you very much for this handsome compliment that you have paid me. Nobody, no girl has ever paid me such a compliment. <laughs> These are some of the effects of my core of popularity, which was yes. totally unexpected. Okay, next. Mm -hmm. So we have come to the last question. Thank you for joining us. This has been an enlightening, enlightening experience for me and I'm sure this will be an enlightening experience for 
everybody who reads, I mean, uh, watches this interview. And you continue to influence so many people with your answers. In one sentence, what do you think you have to say to your followers? Or you ought to say to your followers? My humble gratitude and grateful thanks for your massive support, show of support. My apologies to a large number of my followers who are disappointed with me for having monetized my answers. To them, my uh, invitation is, anytime you have noticed an answer which you want to read and you were blocked from reading, feel free to message me and I will send that, uh, send me your email address. I will send you that copy of that answer by via, via email. So I don't want to deny you. At the same time, I don't want to deny myself an opportunity for any kind of income. That is why I'm monetizing my answers mm -hmm. and I'm ready for the reduced number of views. But at the same time, if somebody is really keen, I don't want to block him from reading merely because that person hasn't paid a subscription. So yes. my followers are free to contact me. I will send them a copy of their answer. Mm -hmm. But on Quora, I continue to keep my monetization on as long as the scheme exists until Quora formally withdraws it. So this is my message to my followers. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. This has been amazing. With this, uh, we say adieu to you and to our viewers and come to the close of this interview. Thank you so much.